still one more minute, but we're recording now. Hello, everyone, and a big welcome to our members and guests. My name is Maria Jelanitas, and I am this year's president of the DIA. The two key mandates of the Digital Imaging Association are to provide education and networking opportunities for our members. I hope you find the educational aspect of this webinar worthwhile, and we invite your feedback. Our membership is comprised of pre-press, printers, packaging converters, designers, advertisers, print buyers, equipment and consumable manufacturers and vendors. If you are with us as a guest, please consider joining the Digital Imaging Association. If you would like more information on membership, please contact either myself or Mark McLeod at 416-254-4941 or Marg at digitalimagingassociation.com. Like most trade associations today, financial stability does not come from the membership revenues alone. And so we turn to the vendor suppliers to support our goals as an association. We are honored to continue to receive the support and recognition of the DIA's contribution to the growth and development of the graphics industry from the following companies. Our platinum sponsors, Canon, Durst, HP, Konica Minolta, Spicers, Swiss Q Print, and Trinet Global Logistics. Our gold sponsors, Adobe, Fujifilm, Graphics Canada, Kodak, Heidelberg, and our silver sponsor, Sydney Stone. Please consider these companies and their demonstrated support of the industry when making your purchasing decisions. Technology for this webinar has been generously provided by HP. Our moderator for today's session is Stephen Longmire, National Sales Manager, Sydney Stone, a silver DIA sponsor. Stephen's roles include researching new product lines and manufacturers to distribute, setting pricing structures, managing the partner program, and conceiving and implementing marketing initiatives to support sales effort. Stephen has served on the DIA board for six years, including the last two years as president. Stephen, I'll pass it over to you to introduce today's exciting topic and our panel of experts. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, today's topic is labels and flexible packaging, reality versus impact. Today's panel will address the status of the label and flexible packaging markets and what impact digital technology has had in this industry sector. Digital presses are producing sellable product in the 160 foot per minute range, states Victor Gomez, Director of Industrial Labels for Epson Canada. And what is the benefit to the converter or even more speed to rival their existing flexographic presses? What is more important? Oh, my apologies. Uh, what is more important to the business owner is throughput. And that entails a host of other pro production issues that don't usually make it to marketing pieces, such as uptime, maintenance routines, and ease of use. If the mechanism for higher linear speed entails adding more complexity to the system, more print heads, for example, the overall benefit is actually much smaller. Something similar applies to resolution. Does a race to higher DPN, DPI result in better looking labels? Does a higher DPI matter if it gets lost in the viewing distance of the typical consumer when picking up a product from the shelf? Today's webinar will address these questions and many more. I'd like to introduce our panel members today, beginning with Deanne Sinclair. She is the president and owner of Cambridge Label. Deanne is a passionate entrepreneur and proud family business owner at Cambridge Label Incorporated, where she's worked for the past 13 years. Deanne applies her formal business training to leading change within the operations finance and marketing teams. In addition to her managerial responsibilities, Deanne is also a major advocate for innovation in the printing industry. Under her leadership, Graf uh, Cambridge Label has purchased a digital press, a laser die cutting machine, shrink sleeve equipment, and a brand new state-of-the-art flexographic press, leading the way to new business opportunities. Deanne has an honors business administration degree and a master's of business degree from the Ivy Business School. Deanne is the director of the Digital Imaging Association. Thank you, Deanne, for joining us today. Thank you. Our next panel member is Jeff Summer. Jeff is vice president in business development at Lorpun Labels. Jeff isn't an order taker, he's an idea guy. He asks questions and offers opinions. 
He assesses all the angles and gives you the information that you need to make an informed decision. If there's something Lower Pond has never made before, they'll figure out how to do it, do it affordably, and do it well. Whether it's sourcing new equipment, evaluating new production methods, or connecting with dependable partners, he finds a solution that will help you break into new markets, create a connection with your customers, and unequivocally own the shelf. Want, uh, walk, sorry, want to talk about the possibilities of digital? Jeff is your man. As Lorpun's resident digital champion, he's an incredibly passionate individual about how new technology is changing the packaging landscape and creating new and existing exciting opportunities for growth. Thank you, Jeff, for joining us today as well. Our next panelist member is Cled D'Souza, Senior Director, Technical Solutions, Graphic Systems and Solutions with Spicers. Cled is the former owner and VP of Sales and Marketing at All Graphic Supplies, which was acquired by Spicers Canada, ULC, in February of 2020. He has over 30 years of specialized experience in wide format imaging equipment, software, label and packaging, printing solutions, finishing, and productivity solutions such as digital textile manufacturing, direct to garment, dye sublimation solutions for both commercial and industrial applications, as well as UV cure print technologies, workflow management, and process improvement. Clad has also owned and operated a screen printing, sign graphics, and pad printing operation. Thank you, Clyde, as well, for joining us today. We also have joining us today, David Haley, Flexible Packaging Specialist with HP. David is a 17-year veteran of the flexible packaging industry, having held such diverse roles as supply chain manager, operations manager, general manager, and sales contributor. HP Indigo leverages this experience and knowledge to support their customers as they progress through the process of implementing flexible packaging production. Thank you so much, Dave, for joining us today. We also have Phil, Philip Hampson, Regional Sales Manager with Durst. Philip has 28 years of inkjet experience in Canada and has worked with Partners Graphic, Ernest Green, and Mondrian Hall, as well as Fujifilm. He joined Canon to help develop the Canadian market for cut sheet and continuous inkjet fed presses. And Phil is excited to be with Durst, where he's responsible for inkjet solutions in the label, packaging, corrugated, fabric, as well as display markets. Thank you, Phil. At this point, I'd like to let our attendees know that uh, we will be posing questions to the panel, but if you yourself have any questions you'd like to pose, please put it in the chats window. Uh, if you wanted to post to a specific panel member, please designate the panelist member's name in the question. If not, I'll pose it to the best suiting members of the panel or the panel as a whole, depending on the questions. Okay, thank you everybody for joining us today. As we begin today, I'd like to Pose this. I'll, I'll, actually, I'll begin with Jeff on this one. Uh, what consumer trends are you seeing in the flexible packaging industry for North America and in, la in the label industry specifically? Um, I would say in the label industry, we're seeing you know a continuation of what's been happening over the last few years is massive skew proliferation. Um, we're seeing a drive for you know some hyper personalization, so people are wanting to personalize for different regions or different languages. Um, we are seeing, you know, variable content coming in. Um, you know, these are all things that digital print technology is really the only, you know, you, you can't do a lot of this stuff analog. So we're just that, you know, it's, it's a lot of small runs that are aggregated together to still form, you know, the overall volume, but lots and lots of changeovers of, of specific SKUs. Fantastic. I'll pose it next to Deanne because you obviously have both a, a new flexographic press as well as the digital presses as well. Uh, what trends are you seeing yourself? Yeah, uh, similar to Jeff, we've seen a lot more variable data type work um, even in the last year than we, we ever have before. Interestingly enough, though, um, and we'll get into this later, I'm sure, but I'm seeing... Um, you know, if a customer wants to try something new, say a unique stock that I wouldn't have on the floor, just given the lead times of getting that, a lot of people are kind of foregoing these crazy creative ideas that they have because they don't want to wait. Um, I'm seeing a lot of that people, you know, consumers opting for more of a standard offering, um, just given the lead times of some of these more unique items. The other thing I'd like, I'd just like to add one more thing is what we're seeing is a lot more requests for embellishments and special effects. So the digital print is one thing, but if you're really looking to stand out on shelf, you're often doing it in a hybrid format, either adding 
you know, flexo printing to the digital print, you're adding screen printing, you're adding foil, embossing, that kind of thing. It's really, you know, again, a, a trademark of our company is on the shelf. So it's companies who are looking to really grab that consumer attention as they're walking down the aisle, like what's going to catch their eye versus the regular print. So kind of goes in, hand in hand with digital, um, but it's often like a hybrid type of, uh, you know, that's what how the embellishments are mainly done um, right now. Absolutely, spot UV or even getting into like augmented reality triggered, triggered yep. wine bottles. I know that's been a big push recently as well. Uh, David, I might ask you as well, given your, your flexographic uh, experience in the industry, what, uh, what trends are you seeing in terms of uh, flexible packaging, specifically flexographic? Uh, specifically flexographic. Or, well, you know, or it, either, or either or. You in terms of, you know, in terms of print quality um, uh, for flexographic, you know, I think they're still pursuing something uh, along the lines of 200 line screen, uh, Samba screening uh, type of a thing. Like, you know, it's been three years since I've been in the flexographic industry. I probably have lost touch with with all of their pursuits as it relates to print quality. But I know that was a big thing back, uh, you know, when I was directly in a in an operation. But as far as digital goes, my colleagues here have uh, very uh, clearly uh, characterized the print aspect of what customers are, or, or, or what the trends are from a print, from a, from a visual point of view. But from a flexible packaging point of view, um, obviously stand-up pouch is, has been the major trend in flexible packaging for almost a decade. And it just continues to be. And, you know, not least uh, of the reasons for that is a transition from rigid flexible, or excuse me, rigid packaging to flexible packaging. So, you know, one particular product that I would point out in particular that I know we've probably all interacted with is protein powder. So protein powder, not too awful long ago, only came in, uh, you know, extruded rigid or injection molded rigid packaging with a big heavy lid and a big heavy seal. And, you know, it's not uncommon for those things to weigh 1000 grams a piece just for one. So the transition of that type of a product to a pouch, which I would say half that, half that product probably is inflexible pouches today. I mean, that's a huge trend and it's happening across all the industries, all the markets, and it's, and it's only getting, more and more uh, prevalent. So yeah, that's a, I mean, that's a trend that ha it, it has a track record and it's still very sharply upward too, I think. Fantastic. Um, Phil, what, uh, what do you see in terms of Durst customers in terms of kind of the trends that you're seeing your customers uh, reaching out for? Yeah, we're, we are definitely seeing the, the call for embellishments. Um, and, you know, with, with our platform, we can have the ability to have a standalone roll-to-roll -roll capabilities or have a hybrid uh, configuration. And I would say the, the hybrid configuration, whether it's being driven by competitors, but it's definitely becoming more and more prevalent uh, because to add, like David was saying, to some of the pouch applications, and then obviously what Jeff was saying, to so some of the embellishments. So we're definitely seeing more uh, interest in, in hybrid configurations with our digital presses. Oh, perfect. And Colette, I'll, I'll pose the same to you as well. So we're seeing, um, we, we, our area of concentration is mostly on um, kind of entry level short run label production where it really is an extension of uh, existing businesses and some new businesses that are trying to serve the needs of um, short run applications of labels from anywhere from a few 50, 100 labels to a few thousand where, um, you know, the, uh, there's a lot of, um, variable data, either imagery or, you know, actual uh, markings, high quality, and for uh, several applications of food products. Uh, and there are two segments, one for applications that would be considered indoor, as well as durable there, where we could have labeling for outdoor or durable uh, labeling, such on hard hats and so forth. So those are the uh, predominant areas we focus on. And we've seen enormous growth, especially since uh, you know, the pandemic where many, many small companies, including restaurants, uh, 
uh, small companies that are producing fruit juices and specialty products, food products, are labeling these things in short runs and you know sometimes to different markets in different languages. So uh, our solutions are really generally small, they're simple. Uh, they don't have too many additional features like embellishments. They're CMYK printers or white and can print onto uh, a fair range of uh, consumable products and generally, you know, in shorter lengths and shorter run or quick turnaround. And uh, many of our customers are also selling this as an online fulfillment business. Fantastic. Um, I might actually begin this next question with Jeff, uh, since you're a relatively early adopter of digital uh, label printing. With the entry to market becoming increasingly more lucrative for digital technology, what challenges should should newcomers be aware of? Kind of like, what have you learned from uh, going in relatively early? What should people be wary of? I'd have to say that when we first went into digital, the learning curve was very steep in terms of the transition from analog to digital. Um, basically, we had to rewrite our whole company's SOPs and organization. We went from, you know, one person in pre-press to we ha we've had up to four at times. And the real challenge is that every single job hits your pre-press department. Whereas if you're an analog shop or a label shop or flexible packaging doing flexo, your you know, repeat orders are just going to your, your plate room and you're pulling the plates and you're running them. Digital is totally different. And, you know, so if what I really realized is the press is one thing, it's kind of the easy thing. It's the workflows and it's your software. It's, you know, are you using ESCO? Are you partnered with hybrid? If you're not, if you don't have the budget to really bring in the, the complete workflows to be successful, I think you're going to do it part-time. Like it's not really going to be, you know, a transition for your company, right? So you really have to come to, you know, having a digital, like we, I, I like to say we are looking to digitize everything in our business. And I don't necessarily mean, you know, it, the, the analog presses, but everything that gets to the presses, it's the workflow systems, it's the job costing, it's everything, our web portal, website, how we communicate with clients. We're looking to digitize every aspect of the business, our pre-press department, especially. So that's, you know, it's the buying the press, talking to HP and Durst and other vendors, that's the easy part. The other part is the real challenging aspect of your organization. Do you find too with like the web to print portal, you mentioned that kind of scaling down the amount of options and variables that you will kind of you accept to kind of mitigate some of the, uh, the pre-press work that has to be done, adjusting of files, things like that kind of- Look, you can, it depends what your budget is and how much you want to spend on the software. I don't fully, like we're a B to, we're a B to B. We don't sell to consumers. So, you know, our, we're not a full web to print portal where people are designing our work, but our portal is designed for businesses and people who are buying packaging and buying labels as part of a large organization to make their lives easier. So nobody's going in and designing their own artwork. There are already people that do that and do it really well. You have you know the vista prints of the world and their competitors we're not interested in continuing that market we're we're completely b2b and focused on you know cpg companies essentially food beverage cosmetics like any consumer product goods that's where our focus is fantastic deanne I'll, I'll ask you the same question in terms of sort of what were the challenges you should be aware of heading into that having gone through it yourself yeah i think too um more generally speaking, for those who don't currently do, say, label printing, who are looking to get into it, there's so much to learn on the side of adhesives. Um, you know, our die cutting process is very exact. You're die cutting to a liner, and, and even that is, you know, uh, quite a skill in and of itself, because if you do it minorly too deep and the labels are being machine applied, that will wreak havoc uh, entirely uh, for the actual user of the labels. Uh, but, you know, similar to Jeff, I think actually um, becoming even good at operating and efficient at operating, uh, say a digital press is also, you know, learning how to operate the press is one thing, but learning how to operate it efficiently is there's quite a knack to that. There's quite a learning curve in my opinion. Um, and I don't think, um, I don't think it's as easy as it seems at, at face value. I was actually trained on our equipment and uh, I don't think anybody wants me near it, so. 
<laughs> I imagine too, it almost comes down to a lot of workflow too, in terms of changing stock consistently, but trying to match up jobs to sit with the same stock to try to bundle those rather than have changeovers and downtime as well. Absolutely. So having people who are like proactive, looking at for orders coming through the pipeline, um, just trying to operate as efficiently as possible is, um, is yeah, where, you know, you either have someone who's a really good operator or potentially not, right? Perfect. Uh, David, I might actually ask, turn this more to the vendor question too for, for our three panels who are vendors as well. But uh, when you're guiding and kind of interacting with the end customer on behalf of the manufacturers you represent, what do you encourage them to be made aware of? So they're going in eyes wide open rather than kind of rose colored glasses on. Well, you know, um, I think, uh, I think uh, something I see often as uh, printers are, entering flexible packaging for the first time is frankly it's sticker shock uh, when it comes to sourcing and acquiring talent so in flexible packaging there's not a whole bunch of people coming out of college going holy cow i gotta go get into flexible packaging you know i mean that's just not really a thing there's a couple of schools that do a really good job uh, with their programs training for it but uh, flexible packaging experience and expertise um, is it's a seller's market for that and everybody in the industry knows it now and it's heavily leveraged among you know at, whether it's at the um, management uh, in the management uh, segment of the business or in the production segment of the business like you guys have been pointing out so uh, you know if um, you know if if you're used to paying $30 an hour for a pressman, for instance, um, it might, you might be experiencing more like 40 uh, for, flex, for, a, for a wide web operator and flexible packaging. And then you, and then that's kind of really where you lose the crossover. Like that's the last similarity between uh, other types of print industries and flexible packaging, you know, because now you're going to go onto a converting line uh, that does not have a similar type of uh, um, it doesn't have a similar type of uh, analog or, or machine in those other print industries. So now you're diverging significantly away from print into pure flexible packaging. So you really don't have anything to compare the uh, going hourly rate for a converting line operator. So, you know, you might get your first interview and find out that the guy expects $50 an hour. And you're like, oh, whoa, holy cow, I don't pay anybody in my business $50 an hour. Uh, but that's what that guy's going to end up getting somewhere. And the same for a pouch machine operator. So that sticker shock and then, and then you know, uh, managerial people like supervisors and, and managers uh, are the same way. So just uh, kind of preparing them for, you know, as you look to grow your flexible packaging business and you you run up on the inevitable need of acquiring talent, it's, this is what you're going to face. Perfect. Uh, Phil, I'll ask the same question of you in terms of advising your customers down the sales journey. Yeah, it's, it's been an interesting start for me because obviously I'm, most of you guys know I'm kind of new to label, uh, but then, you know, in the wide, large format, all that stuff for quite some time. So I've had a lot of those type customers, a lot of digital type customers thinking, hey, this is great. Label looks exciting, looks like they're busy. Maybe we can all make money on this. And there's a lot of different entry points into label. Obviously you can go small, you can go large. Um, but the biggest thing I caution everything, everyone on is the finishing aspect. I think printing a label is pretty simple. Obviously you got to learn the adhesives like Deanne said, but once the label's printed, then what do you do, right? So I really try and cautious, uh, add caution to my clients about the finishing component can be just as expensive uh, and extremely more complicated than the actual print portion. So I think, you know, some people get excited about, you know, marijuana pouches and, and things like that. And, and just the complexity for, you know, for instance, a large format shop trying to get into that market is extremely difficult. So I, I just really cautious people on the finishing component because there's a highly skilled factor of that after you've printed the label. So. Uh, Clint, I'll ask you as well, with your customers kind of, what to look out for? 
Uh, so majority of our customers, um, you know, across the country are actually already specialized in print and cut on wide format. So in some ways, uh, they already been doing this for a while and uh, short run label in so many circumstances is very much the same thing, except now you're going to a narrow width and the solutions that we provide are smaller pieces of equipment that can fit in small space that are a combination of printers and then subsequent finishing devices that can laminate, cut, remove the matrix and then take up the roll and potentially cut it down to smaller rolls. So the solution that we offer is, is actually pretty concise and simple. And considering the investment, uh, it's, it's not a very large investment. And uh, we try to focus our attention on the customer understanding that he will get this investment back within a two, one or two year period. And uh, also to take on uh, you know, a limited range of different label applications rather than the kind of full gamut that may be there. Uh, we do very little in flexible packaging. It's mostly a label print and cut on demand and, you know, trying to remain within the narrow space of, you know, CMYK and in some cases CMYK and white um, and eight and a half inches wide short run. Perfect. Actually, that kind of segues into another question I was going to ask in terms of, we touched on it a little bit in some of those answers in terms of finishing options. So I might just start with Jeff on this one in terms of when you're formatting your finishing options, I know there's a lot of different variables in terms of embellishments and things like that that cannot be done in line, but do you try to set up your finishing lines as much as possible in an inline configuration or is it more efficient just to have offline? They're so varied in terms of finishing methods. Emphatically no to inline finishing. That's my philosophy. Um, it's just far too complex. There's too many options. You're going to slow down your, your very expensive digital asset. You know, we have a couple digital presses um, and we have like four or five finishing pieces of equipment that all have different capabilities. So, you know, if you look, if you're running digital and you're running hundreds of thousands of feet and you're just die cutting and it's always the same material and you're just varnishing. Yeah. There could be a case made for that. If you're not if you have a big account and you're not switching tooling over, but you're, it's a different skill set with the digital operator versus the converter. Completely different skill set. There is no transferability, right? Die cutting, converting, flexo printing on finishers. You know, Dave can talk about pouching equipment. It's like you can't do this stuff in line. It's totally different types of operators and skill set. Dan, uh, yourself as well, your answer? I do agree. I mean, the nature of the type of work that, that we do is, um, a lot of small to mid-size runs so we have you know various um you know different finishes as an example like we commonly use a gloss or a matte and printable varnish but if you're going to switch from um gloss to matte you have to make sure that that matte varnish isn't contaminated so you know you might spend 25 minutes doing like a very night nice, like perfect wash up so that there's no contamination to the matte and printable varnish. So to try and do that all in line, I think would just, whereas right now we just print boom, boom, one after another, and then put them on separate rolls and kind of send them to, um, you know, we have one, one finishing line that always has matte in it as an example, and one that always has gloss so that we're not forced to do those wash ups. Well, that's fantastic. Great answers. Uh, I'm going to actually introduce a question from one of our attendees today. Jim posed the question of how, now this would be to Deanne and to Jeff, uh, how are you addressing the problem of acquiring and retaining competent production people in order to meet both your and your customers' requirements? Mm -hmm. so let's start maybe with Deanne, since you're Sure. I mean, it's it's challenging. It is challenging. And I'm feeling now more than ever, I don't know if Jeff is, but with the cost of gas going up, groceries, absolutely everything. As an employer, I am feeling the pressure to on kind of the wage side of things. Um, you know, people have higher expectations in terms of a wage just to keep up with the, the cost of living. Um, you know, one thing that I really try and push is kind of our family business culture. And I really do think that we treat our people more as like a member of the work family as opposed to more of a corporate mentality. Um, so I try and spend a lot of time mentoring, training our staff uh, directly. That's how I spend a lot of my time. Um, but then also I think making sure that, you know, keeping your finger on the pulse that they're being compensated according to what the going market rates are, I think is also helpful. I, I did just implement, you know, a wage increase across the board for everybody to keep up with the cost of living. Um, 
and to help with retention because I feel like otherwise people might start, you know, poking around looking for what else is out there. And I just want to keep people compensated appropriately. Have you found to the ability of like training up people in different roles into like operator roles or kind of, I know it's hard to cross train because they're so varied in terms of finishing lines versus production lines, but have you, have you found success with that as well? It's yeah, it's a good question. We always try and promote from within, which kind of can be challenging because then I now have to start all over filling that hole that I just promoted them to. But I think that it's a better way to retain people. So we always first, you know, post internally. I try and find somebody. I'd rather give the opportunity to the people who are already existing uh, rather than hire outside. So I think that helps too. Perfect. Jeff, I'll ask the, the same question to you as well. Yeah, it's been the last since the pandemic started, it's been extremely, it's totally, you know, the labor market's disaster right now. You know, you're comp we're competing with, you know, the Amazon type warehouses that are offering jobs for $22 an hour without a resume, you just show up and you get a job, right? So, you know, that's what we compete with. Everybody, all of us in the industry compete with that. So our job is to make our company a great place to work obviously the compensation has to be there nobody's gonna you know that's the number one thing uh, benefits package vacation packages flexible time off like you know if people have family and stuff like that we try to be as flexible as possible it is easier to do that with our office staff than our production staff um you know and again with with production staff though we've done things like you know we're uh, different shift levels like we're you know we run four days a week 10 hour shifts um and i i'll say though that that moving from analog to digital is one of the solutions for us to attract and retain talent okay it is the number one solution because nobody wants to run even there's less people that want to run even a modern flexo press they're getting their hands dirty with ink. They have a lot of other challenges with it. Whereas digital, we can send somebody out to our, you know, the digital uh, press vendors, you know, Durst is here, HP's here. They have, you know, very um, comprehensive operator training programs. Yes, it's expensive, but you're training operators to be um, skilled and it is becoming less of a journeyman type of trade and more of like a technical, um, trade where people are learning these skills from our vendor partners and um it attracts younger we need to attract younger people to the business and and that is in itself attracting younger people to the business the only thing i you know i kind of we, we can't get away from the converting aspect of of the flexible packaging and label part of the business those are definitely delayed in becoming digitized and fully servo and fully automated setup but that kind of process, the automation and the industry 4.0 and all of the data, that is how you attract young, smart people who want to be in the business. Nobody wants to run a 25-year-old analog press. Okay, I'll be honest with you guys. That's, that's our kind of philosophy. Well, even the interface with these new modern digital presses are so, so computer-driven, obviously. It's sort of, you can geek out a bit with it and it, it can definitely attract the younger crowd. For 100%. Sure. Uh, my next question might be, uh, I'll start off with uh, with David here. Uh, what are the biggest areas of growth do you see in your sector in the next five to 10 years? Well, I think the biggest area of growth for flexible packaging is going to continue to be what it's always been, which is um, human food and medical uh, and pharmaceutical and also pet food. So you know, if you look at things that are fully consumable by humans, such as food and, and medicine, that's a full 85% of all flexible packaging uh, is used for those things. So flexible packaging probably for the last 50 years has grown four to 5% a year, every single year. And it, that number rarely drops out of four and it rarely goes above five. So that's just the growth rate because it's so closely linked uh, to human consumption. Every, every human on earth, all seven and a half billion of us, we all eat food. And it just so happens to be that flexible packaging uh, is mostly used for food. So um, the thing I would point out that's much more exciting than that standard 4% year over year growth rate for the last 50 years is that digital flexible packaging, which has only existed for seven years, 
is growing about 40% a year, year over year. So back in 2015, when this machine, the 25K, the 30 inch machine, when it came out, there really was no such thing as digital flexible packaging. So it's really a product that was enabled by that machine, by that technology. And since, since digital flexible packaging became possible in 2015, there's now estimated $1.2 billion of the industry is on digital. So, and it's almost all in food and, and pharmaceutical and nutraceutical. So uh, that's, that has been always the growth uh, area for flexible packaging. And it's, it's going to continue to be because, you know, the, the population growth forecast out to 2050 has it at 10 billion. So, you know, if we're doing, if it's a, if it's a $250 billion industry worldwide at seven and a half billion, you know, what's it going to be at 10 billion? True. And the nice thing too, with the capabilities of doing, you know, brand integrity, security, printing options, even pharma doing like NFC triggered uh, things like that. It's just, yeah, it's a growing, growing sector for sure. Uh, Phil, I'll ask you sort of the same question. What do you see uh, at Durst in terms of the five and 10 year uh, mm -hmm. forecast and growth? It, yeah, I mean, obviously, I think right now we're at kind of the precipice where quality is is there and it's at 1200 DPI and I don't see us getting much, much better than that. Um, but where I do see uh, our growth would be definitely in the speeds. Um, you know, the speeds will be get, definitely getting better and, and label and corrugated uh, in the single pass formats. Um, and then obviously definite expansion into the corrugated market. That's a huge market for us and a, and a trend where people want to decorate corrugated differently. Um, but we see in the next five to 10 years, I think, again, the quality is where it's at, but I think we'll definitely see an expansion into different formulations of inks. Uh, so we can approve on, you know, inks that are possibly touching food or for different type of applications where there are some limitations with inkjet around that. Um, but we definitely see uh, a growth in expansion of inks and formulations there. Yeah, definitely like low migration inks. Like I know in Europe, they have much more stringent low migration yeah. inks with food packaging than we do here. So, yeah. yeah, and there is a bit of a limitation right now with low migration inks with, with inkjet. Uh, you know, there's some adhesion challenges and speed challenges, but again, I think those will start to improve where you can start getting up to speeds like 300 feet plus uh, in, in those types of applications. So I think there'll be some investment in that. Fantastic. Uh, Claude, I'll ask you the same question in terms of five and 10 year out. What do you see in terms of technology that you'll be carrying? Uh, so as you know, we carry a very wide range of different solutions across multiple market sizes uh, and types. Uh, and the packaging and label side, we've seen um, that um, in the decoration of packaging such as corrugated boxes, on-demand uh, packaging that is used for shipping things, that has been a pretty fast growth area. And uh, the, the solutions that we currently provide are either UV direct to substrate or single pass water-based pigment machines that can print very quickly at about a foot a second. And uh, using water-based pigment inks, those pieces of equipment have been very uh, effective in getting people to decorate these kind of corrugated boxes. And we see that um, single pass printing will become more prevalent in wider widths to accommodate for larger boxes, uh, printing at a very high speed using water-based pigment inks. Um, Jeff, I'm gonna pose this next question to yourself too, because uh, we kind of touched on a little bit previously in terms of supply chain issues, but you as, as a, print provider, what are obviously the major supply chain issues you're encountering? There were, of course, strikes over in Europe at certain paper facilities and things like that. Uh, can you speak a little bit about uh, what's, what's been happening? Has it been releasing and getting a little more eased recently or how's that going? Yeah, the, 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 you know, I, I'm sure a lot of people in this year where the UPM strikes, um, the five plants uh, have have really decimated the, the global supply of label papers for liners and face stocks, massive challenges. And that is not eased up yet. It is gonna take several months for those facilities to ramp up production and to get supply back into North America and Europe as well, um, mainly affecting papers. So we've seen, you know, I don't know, we've had four increases this year on papers uh, and by June we'll have over 40% increase on semi-gloss on any paper. 
thermal papers, your Amazon shipments, all of that stuff, direct thermal, thermal transfer, semi-gloss papers, matte litho papers, and the liners that go with them. Um, the film market, we've seen increases of in the 20% range uh, for films, um, very, very high demand for consumer product goods during the pandemic, which has led to pressure on you know, the label supply chains where we would previously receive product in one to three business days. Now we are semi-gloss paper purchase orders placed today are coming in August or October even. Um, so we've mitigated this by planning ahead. This, these weren't surprises, right? We all knew this was happening. So, you know, over the last year, we've been carrying a lot of inventory. It means clients are making substitutions of materials. They're, you know, going to something that is not ideal. We're running almost full web width, web width on everything because we can't predict what, you know, material we're going to need. So we're basically running, you know, if somebody needs an eight inch web width, uh, and we have 13 inch stock, they're paying for the extra material. That's just the situation it's been in. I don't, you know, I think we will start to see it ease in 2023. I don't think anything's going to change this year. Deanna, I'd like to ask you the same question. <clears throat> Honestly, exact same situation. I called Jeff not too long ago for, as a phone a friend, moral support, because I was like, are you guys experiencing this? Like, this is so awful. I can't take it anymore. Uh, we had to take over more warehousing space, uh, just was totally maxed out. I'm sitting on so much inventory, uh, which is crazy because I've, it's something that we've never had to do. Normally I would receive, you know, supply next day or every two days. Um, so yeah, similarly getting material months and months out, you have no other option but to plan and carry more. And, um, you know, just with labels, there's so many different stocks, adhesives, that sort of thing that in all honesty, there's no way I can possibly carry everything under the sun. So also having to substitute, um, which just means more administration, um, because, you know, you're calling, you're saying, I have the substitute, can you test it? then they want, you know, a free test run. So you do that. Um, it's like I spend, I've been spending a big chunk of my day getting involved with clients working on that kind of stuff. Uh, so I'm very much looking forward to it being over. Hopefully it doesn't take as long as Jeff thinks, but I suspect he's right. <laughs> yeah, sort of, we were almost trained for this Toyota manufacturing model where just in time delivery, not carrying large inventories. And now this has totally turned it on its head. Yes. Yeah. And no quote. I want to say one thing. It's going to be for the, for at least in the label industry, I can't comment so much on the flexible packaging vendor end of the business, but our suppliers have created these programs over the last 20 years that allow us to order exact with kind of what we need when we need it. And a lot of those programs have gone away right now. And you're, you're ordering full web widths. You're doing whatever you can to get what you can. And I can, I, I think, you know, those programs cost a lot of money for our vendors to run and there's a lot of waste. So I think we're gonna see some changes to that supply in 2023 and we're gonna see some scaling back of it and we're gonna, you know, they've, they've had profitable years, right? So I think it's gonna be challenging for them to justify going back to it, depending on what the collective industry of converters, uh, you know, how we react to it, so. Oh, good point, absolutely. Uh, I'd like to actually turn to also our, our product manufacturers here as well, too, in terms of supply chain issues, obviously, global chip shortage and things like that and other components. But uh, David, could you kind of speak to some of the perhaps challenges and contingencies that uh, you've encountered with your role at HP? You know, I'm pretty far removed, actually, from I'm pretty downstream of the supply chain issues that would be impacting HP Indigo. Um, you know, uh, what I could tell from where I sit in the business is... Um, you know, there was a little bit of supply constraint uh, towards the end of towards the end of 2021. Um, I mean, there was some delays in presses and installs. That's really the only thing I saw. And there really wasn't, we didn't change uh, uh, the way we operated in the front half of the business in terms of, uh, you know, continuing to place machines and install machines. We really didn't change any anything we did. Uh, so that probably is to say that uh, the global business unit in Israel, you know, really took, really did a fantastic job managing the supply chain. Now that's, that, that's from my point of view. I don't know 
I'm, I definitely would not consider that I'm a, I'm an expert on that. Um, but, uh, that's, that's how I saw it from my point of view. Sure. Uh, Phil yourself. Yeah, I think first and foremost, what, what we did was make sure that we don't short anyone with ink. You, the worst thing you could do is obviously, you know, have a, a digital press not being able to run because there's no ink available. So we do have ink manufacturing facilities now in the US. Uh, and then we do stock locally here in, in Canada. So touch wood, we, we haven't done that to any of our customers. Um, but on the equipment side, it's still pretty horrible, to be honest with you. It's, it's, uh, they've opened up manufacturing in both plants now in uh, Italy and in Austria. But um, yeah, I mean, my lead times are, are pretty dire uh, at this point, you know, four, four to five months. And, uh, you know, and then once that's manufactured, then you've got to get it over here, right? So that's the other challenge. Um, so yeah, I mean, first and foremost is making sure we have those parts and consumables for the clients. Uh, and then obviously we're just trying to improve upon the delivery of our digital presses to our clients. Okay, and Clint, obviously not, not manufacturing the products you distribute, but also you're obviously encountering those issues with your manufacturers and suppliers as well, I'd imagine. Correct, so you know, each manufacturer has different uh, circumstances depending on the components that go into the machinery. As an, and you also know Spices is a large distributor of consumables across various segments. So every single day we have a group of uh, people who are looking at you know, either alternatives or working with different vendors to establish which are the most um, suitable solutions for customers based on their requirements and also from the various vendors. Uh, but definitely on the equipment side, chip shortages, uh, some components of these machines are being delayed and potentially those small components could delay the delivery of an entire machine. And then on the consumable side, uh, just like um, you know, the ink uh, Phil talked about, this is a major uh, effort for us to ensure that all these printers that we support across the country, and there's, there's many of them, uh, have ink on a day-to-day -day basis so that they continue printing. So it's, uh, it's definitely a, a big, uh, focus for us as a company across Spicers, uh, but fortunately we do have you know almost 20 locations across Canada, and uh, you know we're trying to keep as much inventory and different consumables that people need on a day-to-day -day basis across the country. We, we kind of touched it on a little bit in terms of workflows, but um, Deanne, I'd like to kind of ask you in terms of the workflow that you utilize with some of your new presses. Have you? Have you gone kind of revisited and audited your entire existing workflow in terms of maybe look at either introducing a new workflow based on a new press, or is it more so whenever possible, kind of trying to incorporate the new addition into the existing workflow, or at what point do you actually look at an entire new workflow? Yeah, it's a, a good question. I mean, I, I'm always trying to make our workflow as efficient and scalable as possible. And in a pre-COVID environment, we are actually, in my opinion, pretty old school. Um, we were still like printing out way too much, too, too many things. Um, thankfully, we made the shift in our workflow to go paperless, which was great because then the pandemic hit and then everybody was working from home and we wouldn't have been able to accommodate that had we not gone to more of a paperless workflow type system. Um, on the, on the pre-press side, I must say I'm quite blessed. I have a, a pre-press manager who's really into the workflow side of things. So I don't have to get too much involved. She keeps it high level for me, but of course, as much automation integration as possible um, is kind of what I'm advocating and pushing for. So our MIS, like our internal system communicates directly with um, our pre-press software, which communicates to our presses, um, basically eliminates a lot of rekeying of data once it's in the system. Um, they all kind of talk to one another. So you're not, yeah, you don't have people in this department wreaking the same info time and time again. Uh, so automate, automate, automate uh, as much as possible. Mm. Jeff, I'll, I'll pose the same question to yourself. Yeah, the, I, the workflow is, it's not like you do it once and it's done, right? It is a constant evolution. It's a, you're constantly working on your workflows, right? we have weekly meetings with our teams about what's working and what isn't and if it's not working we modify it so i need to talk with my friend deanne over there about the paperless because it's something we've been we've been working towards we're not there yet um but that kind of information is critical anything written down on a piece of paper is a waste of time and it gets lost and it's not retained so we we again our mi we have a sophisticated mis system that links in 
you know, with our um, ESCO graphics workflow, which links in with our, our HP DFEs, which links in, we actually have, you know, we don't schedule our presses. A person does not schedule our presses anymore. We have algorithmic software-based um, systems that is analyzing every single job in our shop when the material's there, when the tooling's there, when, you know, um, when the job's ready, when the artwork's been approved on the portal by the client, like everything is automated so that, you know, the, the job pops up on the operator screen, like, boom, you got to run this now. And it's also analyzing for efficiencies, like what's the least amount of changeovers of substrates you're doing? What's, you know, if you're running um, uh, a digital press and you need expanded gamut, which of your presses has those expanded gamut colors in it at that time? If you're running white, which press has white in it, right? So it's the workflow, the press is not the critical part of being successful. The, your organizational structure is the critical part of being successful. I would say you could be successful with Durst. You could be successful with HP, but it's a commitment to your organizational structure. That's what's going to end up, you know, separating, you know, the successful companies from the mediocre companies. Absolutely. It's, yeah, it's a living, breathing entity onto its own, basically. Your workflow. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, I might actually pose this question to the, the press manufacturers. I have another one sort of here. Um, in terms of, because we've kind of touched on alternate substrates in the supply chain crunch, how are some of the press manufacturers dealing with alternative substrates, which might not be ideal to spec based on uh, the parameters? I'll start with uh, start with Phil, if that's okay. Yeah, it's it's a challenge. It, it, it is, I'll be honest with you, because there are a lot of substrates being thrown at us on a daily uh, basis, whether it's because it is what's available. Um, so again, I think that kind of goes back to the ease of use of the press, uh, the flexibility of the press. So UV, I think technology is is pretty flexible on what it can print on. I mean, we can we can range from 20 micron up to 18 point card on that platform. Um, so and, you know, when profiling it is a pretty straightforward thing. But I, I would say it is. There are some weird films being thrown at us right now. Uh, so I think there's definitely going to be, like I said in earlier, um, I think that's something we're going to head towards is more adaption and more, um, you know, cross-platform where you can print on more substrates. Uh, I think Inkjet is giving the ability to, for clients to print on more stuff, uh, but obviously there is still some limitations uh, on what you can put on Inkjet onto a surface of a film or, or a foil or something like that, right? Exactly, it'll come down to more, more so like ink formulations versus like for bonding and things like that. So like exactly, easy. yeah, yeah. Because the curing systems are pretty good. I mean, we got you, we got LED pinning on our system, then UV curing. Um, but again, obviously, that's that's not it's not going to suit everything, right? Yeah, uh, Clint, I'm going to ask you next, actually, because you're in a bit of a unique situation where you're providing equipment, but you're also providing a large portion of substrates as well. Uh, in your role, but of course, obviously, if customer if they need and they can't source it necessarily through through spicers, they might have to go through alternative channels. How are you kind of assisting your your uh, your customers in terms of the, the different substrates? So, as you know, spicers carry a very vast range of different solutions, and for those kind of mainstream solutions, we try to keep stock of it uh, across the country and in large enough quantities to support all of the different customers that we have. Of an occasion, uh, they may need something more specialized, and uh, in those cases, you know, we would work with uh, our vendors to see if we can do some drop shipments, or if we can kind of uh, find an alternative. Something is missing, so it's an everyday effort of uh, our existing consumables team to to look for those solutions. Uh, we've not been introducing too many new things in the past, you know, maybe six months to one year because of some of these logistical situations. Uh, but more trying to align better and closer to some of our existing suppliers and to kind of identify in advance if there is going to be some delays so that we can find alternatives. Uh, so far, uh, I'd say we're, we're in a good position because uh, when we started recognizing that there is some, some of these situations were going to occur, we, we decided to stock up on, on some of these consumables last year. Perfect. Um David, I'll ask yourself too, in terms of uh, different substrates, maybe not ideal <laughs> operating spec, but something that they could source at the time. Um, how are you guys dealing with that in terms of testing and things like that? Well, you know, the, the, the really amazing thing about the 25K as it relates to uh, the way it interacts with substrates is that 
there is really no limitation to what it what it can run and what it does run on a day-to-day basis. So all FDA approved for uh, primary food packaging substrates runs on the machine. And um, the technical spec on that is um, 12, uh, 10 micron on the low side and 16 point board on the high side. And because the machine, it can run paper, it can run filmic substrates, uh, it can run coated substrates, uncoated substrate. It can really basically run everything there, there is uh, in the market. So uh, to say that, um, <clears throat> can it use alternative substrates? Yes, it can use everything that's currently available um, in the market. Uh, the, when I think of alternative substrates, I'm thinking of actual uh, more just around the commercialization of the product type of type of alternative substrates like fully recyclable uh, uh, medium density uh, polyethylene for fully recyclable pouches or compostable films uh, for uh, uh, compostable uh, suitable applications. So that's really when I hear alternative, uh, that's kind of what I think of. But in regards to availability of materials, you know, the, the 25K can run like I said, anything from super thin to super thick uh, with really minimal uh, differences between them. And uh, it's 30 inches wide. So it's, it's a good uh, web width uh, for a lot of different applications. So uh, yeah, it, it can run a lot of different things. So it's very flexible in that way. Appreciate that. Uh, Deanne, I'm gonna ask you a question. I don't wanna kind of put you on the spot, but uh, if you have the capability of kind of having like a wish list of a either a digital production device or a or a finishing or converting uh, device or application that doesn't currently exist. What would it be? Kind of like the number one feature, kind of the missing sort of link that you would find or that you would want. Yeah, good good question. Um, I don't know if if the uh, press manufacturers on the call will like my response, but um, in all honesty, I. I think that digital technology, what comes to mind for me is speed. Obviously, the faster, the better, you know, you want throughput to be to be fast. Um, you know, if you compare digital speed, so to Flexo, in my opinion, they're pretty on par with some, you know, some presses now, digital presses for labels, they're running 200 plus feet a minute, 250 feet per minute. And the print quality with them is is also pretty good. I think the limiting factor now is not so much the wish list, but it's more the cost of the ink and the consumables on digital is still really quite high. And I think that's limiting the the adoption of digital um, or slowing it down a bit, um, still leaving a place for Flexo in the market. So I think through, you know, hopefully, um, you know, greater adoption of digital, maybe economies of scale, uh, we'll see digital kind of take more market share from flexo so i think long story short i don't my my wish list is more on <laughs> the, the cost of operating the equipment in all seriousness because i think the technology is is there uh, i'll ask jeff as well i know you'd mentioned kind of servo driven converting lines and things like that but if there was one thing either production or finishing or converting what would you uh what would you want to see can they print money <laughs> like legit money that's not that looks no i'm just kidding um no I, I think um i think that the the crossover is very blurred between analog and digital right now i think uh like dd said the some of the equipment out there is running at the same speed but you can't just look at the press speed you have to look at the downtime and how long it takes to set jobs up and the changeovers that to me is more critical than the actual fpm on a press right on a web press um, the consumable costs, definitely they're like, it, it, you know, on longer runs with that, you're going to see adoption of longer run digital based on consumable, not based on FPM. That's the limiting factor. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, both of these guys on the call, they have new presses coming out that are faster. HP has got a 500 feet per minute press, like in beta right now, like that is going to destroy Flexo. Like that is you know, there will be no, again, the limiting factor is going to be the cost of the consumables, not the feet per minute, right? It's, it's that cost structure. Uh, wish list in terms of embellishment, because we do a lot of embellishments, um, 
you know, we, we do see the digitization of that coming, like different types of embellishment. And that, that is out now in a, in a very early adoption stage. We've never been, you know, the trailblazer. I'd rather come in second and do it better, right? It's, you know, you let somebody else figure things out and you don't necessarily have to be the first person in that kind of game. You just have to be the best person in that game. So, you know, I, I, that, that will transform the industry, I think, more in the next three, four years, more than faster presses. Fantastic. I've heard the reference before, the bleeding edge, kind of all the sufferings of being first one in. So. Yeah. <laughs> that was fantastic. Well, my gosh, the time really did fly. We're already at 1.30. We've done an hour. I very much enjoy, enjoyed our discussion today. I very much like to thank our panelists. I'd rather thank Phil, Jeff, David, Fled, and Deanne very much. I'd also like to thank our platinum sponsors very much. Uh, which is Canon, Durst, HP, Anika Minolta, Pfizer, Swiss Q Prince, and Trina. Our gold sponsors, which is Adobe. Back up, Phil. Back up, uh, Paul. Sorry. There you go. Adobe, Fujifilm, Graphics Canada, Kodak, and Heidelberg, as well as our silver sponsor, Sydney Stone. The technology, as mentioned, was graciously provided by HP today for this webinar. I would also like to let everyone know that uh, we have our Digital Imaging Association Golf Tournament taking place on Thursday, June the 16th. We are currently 90% sold out. So I would encourage anyone who is interested to contact Marg, whose email is on the screen there to book your time. It's at Deer Creek Golf Course, it's a fantastic event. I'd also like to, uh, our next information meeting will be in October. So we're gonna have a bit of a, a, fam a summer off, which would be brilliant. Uh, I'd also like to thank you for joining us today. Hope you found it educational and fun. Uh, in appreciation of our panelists' um, generous donation of their time today, we're going to be actually donating on behalf of the Don Game uh, Canadian Print Scholarship Fund on all of their behalves today. So I'd like to thank all of our panelists and thank all of our attendees today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Take care. You know, let's just stay on for a second. <clears throat> If I can get my face back from here. We just wait for the numbers to go down, everybody. <clears throat> Maria, how'd you get your face back up there? I'm trying. Am I back on? Yeah, you're back on. Or you were. Hey, hey Paul, do we, get a, do, we get, on. do we get oh, to know so. who was on the call? Or do we sure. get a, I do. You can see them, actually. They were in the attendee list. <laughs> yeah, I'll send you the list. There, All right, cool. There's still people in it. I don't know if they're if they're on this part of the yeah, call or not. But three attendees right now. Can you uh, can you opt them out? Uh, that's just board members. Hello, boys. There's we have a hand up. raise now. There's jo there's Joseph. <laughs> what do you want, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> you can come on. All right. Uh, you guys did an awesome job. Thank you so much. That was really, really good information. It was really cool. Yeah, you guys were great. Yeah, and and job, you Steve. actually gave us a couple of topics for next year. <laughs> yeah, because we did job, the, Stephen. Uh, oh, no, thanks. Moderating, that was fantastic. Thank you. Oh, glad you guys made it easy. It was great. You were very open and uh, yeah, very easy to to host and moderate. It was great. So. Appreciate that. Yeah, uh, the yeah. cybersecurity one, we've done it before, but it's changed so much in the years since. Uh, yeah, I think it'd be great. It's ever changing, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the other one that um, uh, Paul and I were just going back and forth with some suggestions, and um, one of them was uh, more on digital finishing. And um, yeah. yeah, and just, you know. That's in my will. Don't know digital yet. Interesting so digital not, embellishment. <laughs> but it's true, you know, something every appointment that I go on now, um, it's not really about the press, it's about that, uh, about the finishing side of things. So it, I'm not sure yeah. if you follow me on LinkedIn or not, but just even a simple little post I did over at Scan Pack there a couple of weeks ago, just a simple Consberg table, watching that thing do its work. I got more calls and information about that than any of the other posts I've done. Just simple little stuff like that. So I think people are hungry to find out the answers to that, whether it's folding cards or the, converting or whatever. That's where the that's where the money is. That's where the value add is. Like 
if you're looking to sell your product at a higher price, you need to do something to, you know, justify that extra value that you're adding, right? So. Maria, can you tell me how to put my face back on here? Because I, I got on, go, go, go to the three dots. You're there. Yeah, he's, he's already on. Oh, I can't see myself though. Yeah. Can, Maria, oh, go can you to turn the three them off? dots. We can see you. You can see you. That's good enough, man. Yeah. yeah can, can we just turn it off?